but today I want to teach on communion. I've taught on it before throughout the years. I'm sure you've heard people teach on it. Sure, you've done your own study on it. But to me, as we understand and know, the Word of God declares faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So whatever is being taught from God's Word, faith is going to arise. Faith is going to increase. Faith is going to even gestate in your spirit to bring forth the very thing you need to be manifested in your life. So it's good that we are reminded that, that, we, that we, you know, at least go behind a few layers of the extent of communion, the power of communion, the full scope, the, the, the all-inclusive reaching hand of God connected with communion. Uh, because the Bible even makes it clear two things about communion. First of all, whoever uh, partakes of communion unworthily, the Bible says, that judgment will come upon them. Now, this is one of the few places in the entire Word of God where God's Word says that if you, if you violate my Word in this regard, if you don't fulfill what needs to be fulfilled, in this case, um, there again, when, it mean, when, it, when the Word of God says whoever partakes of communion unworthily, it means there's sin in your life, there's a lifestyle that you're, that you're holding on to, you're harboring, uh, also you're harboring bitterness, unforgiveness, uh, even borderline hate and all of that kind of stuff, that falls under that category of unworthy. I'm not going to get into that necessarily today. just want to touch on it real quick, what I just did. I've taught in that more detail in the past, but uh, the Bible makes it clear, which Paul goes on to say when he's teaching on that very issue in 1 Corinthians, that those who partake of communion, he's talking to the, the church, those who partake of communion unworthily, Christians who do so, he said this is one of the reasons why you're sick and you're dying prematurely. It's extremely powerful. There, there is life. There's sustenance. There is substance, spiritual substance that will take you throughout your entire life, found in communion. And so when Christians either partake of unworthily or they don't fully do it in remembrance of Christ. Because remember, Jesus said, Paul reiterates what Christ said. There you go. When Paul's teaching on communion, he's, he's really exegeting about communion when Christ established it in Matthew 26. That's where we're going to start. When Paul said that Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. So as often as you do it. A, a Christian can partake of communion as often as they like. You can partake of communion every day. You don't need a pastor. You don't need a spiritual leader to bless the elements and give them to you. You can do that all by yourself. You can do that with your family, in your home, the privacy of your home, you, your wife, uh, children, etc. You, you can do that whenever you so desire. I, I've encouraged people over the years that if you're not feeling well, you're at home, partake of communion. Appropriate the benefits and the power of communion. Because we need to understand that, uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but um, we need to do it in remembrance. I'll stay on that, on that train of thought for now. Do it in remembrance. It simply means that you understand fully what you're doing. He institutes communion, which there again, this speaks so great of the selfless spirit that he had. Knowing everything that was going to go on, he's ministering to them. Matthew 26, verse 26, it says this. Jesus teaching, Jesus speaking. And when he said, as, as, as they were gathered together, Jesus took uh, the bread, he blessed, he broke it, he gave it to the disciples. Notice the succession of order there. He took the bread. He blessed it, he broke it, and gave it. He blessed it, he broke it, he gave it. He blessed it, he broke it, he gave it. He has done that with the entirety of the Word of God. God's Word has been blessed, needless to say. He broke it, or actually, he, he has disseminated it by the Holy Spirit to us, then he gives it to us, piecemeal by piecemeal, so we can ingest it, digest it, and live thereby. So he blesses it, he breaks it, he gives it to the disciples, and he says, take, eat, this is my body. He goes on to say in verse 27, he took a cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. So he wanted all of his disciples. Judas had already left, which is a very clear type here that people who are against Christ cannot partake of communion. Because Jesus didn't want this judgment to come upon Judas because Judas had to die from the judgment of betraying Christ alone. 
So all of them drank it. So the 11 disciples at this point with Christ, verse 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. He covers right there very concisely. He covers what these elements represent. Of course, that unleavened bread signifying no sin in the bread. We know that this is Passover. We go all the way back. You don't have to turn there, though. Exodus chapter 12, when God instituted Passover, God made it very clear that when you make the bread, that you're going to partake of a Passover and, of course, partake of the sacrificial lamb. Now, when you do that, make sure there's no leaven in that bread. Because in both Old and New Testament, it's repeated again and again, leaven symbolized sin. The yeast, which we would primarily call it yeast today, which, of course, makes dough rise, makes wheat, of course, make any, makes any kind of grain, any kind of grain product makes it rise, that, that leaven, that yeast, symbolized in a symbolic manner. God didn't say you can't eat it any other time. He said you can. Uh, if you eat a lot of it, it's going to have some damage in effect to a degree. Interesting to note, 21st century, people are finally catching on. But anyway, God said you eat too much of it, it, it can have a physiological effect on you. But notice this, symbolically, it's, it's referring to sin. So the unleavened bread... And when Jesus offered that, he was declaring that this represents, this is not the literal body of Christ as a certain religion teaches. When they say, when they, when they distribute communion, they say, take uh, the body of Christ. That is not the body of Christ. It represents the body of Christ. Some would say, well, well why, why are you splitting hairs on this? Well, because it's very important. Because if, if, you, are saying, if you are saying that this represents the body of Christ, you are saying then that he never died for you. And that he was never buried, he never rose again. That's very important we understand that. I know you know that, but, but we need to, we, we need to get, be clear on that. It does not represent, uh, excuse me, it, 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 does, it is not his body. When someone says that, I mean, that, that's fallacy, it's even heresy. I need, I need at least an hour to teach on that, but I don't have time. Let me keep moving here. So anyway, Jesus made it clear, the little translation, this represents my body. Because of the doctrine of transubstitution, when we partake of that wafer, it's in the place of, somebody say, in the place of the body of Christ, the body of Christ, okay? So when we are partaking of that, it's as though, not, not of course, his literal body, it's as though thousands of years later, we are partaking of pre- and post-resurrection of the body of Christ. When we understand that wafer alone and its significance and what Jesus did when he, re when he received the beating upon himself, that when we partake of that wafer in communion, there should be, and I say this a lot when we participate in communion, there should be a fresh impartation of healing. And hopefully I, I, I can cover this here over the next couple of minutes. There should be a, a fresh release, a new release of the healing virtue of Jesus Christ by faith into our life, into our bodies. Now, go with me if you will. We're going to turn to a couple places if you'd like. Let's start all the way back in the book of Isaiah. Now, when Jesus said there again, this represents my body, which is broken for you. He said that, correct? So we know, according to the book of Psalms, that none of the bones of Christ were broken. The reason why is because he would not be able to bring sh shalom into our life if his bones were broken. Because shalom, which of course is the peace of God, it also means nothing broken. Nothing broken, uh, nothing, left out of, nothing left out of place, left out of joint, you could even say. So that was one of the several reasons why his bones could not uh, be broken which I'm sure you've studied this or heard this over the decades if you've been a Christian, is that what the Roman soldiers did to, <clears throat> excuse me, those who died of crucifixion to make it em emphatically certain that they were dead is that they would break the legs of them because during that process of that slow agonizing death, the victim would continue to raise themselves up by their feet to push themselves up so they could breathe. Because their arms were suspended 
as high as they possibly could. So eventually, of course, with all that blood flowing and coagulating the lower extremities, they would have to push themselves up to breathe. And so the Roman soldiers, and sometimes to kind of speed the process, they would break their legs so they could no longer push themselves up and die that much faster. Well, when they went to break the legs of Jesus, which is recorded in the Bible, when they went to break his legs, they realized he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs even as an extra measure just for what that's worth. Because there again, if any of his bones were broken, shalom could not be applied to you. But his skin was broken open. It was lacerated from head to toe. It's been taught incorrectly that he received uh, 39 stripes. That's not accurate. Only the Jew, under Jewish punishment, if it levied a beating of, you know, of, of course, by a whip, they would, they would stop and only count at 39 and stop there. But Jesus was under Roman jurisdiction. They had no restraint. They beat that person until they either passed out or died. Whichever came first, they didn't care. So when Jesus was beaten beyond recognition, Isaiah saw this about 700 years B.C. Notice this in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 14. It says, just as many were astonished at you. This is referring to Christ. Chapters 52 and 53 was this prophetic vision that Isaiah had there again nearly 700 years before it even happened. Just as many as were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, or actually his appearance. His appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. I want you to get this picture. When Jesus said, look, my body's going to be broken for you, he knew that Isaiah 52, verse 14, would have to be fulfilled. So this is what Isaiah saw 700 years B.C., and this is what is barely touched on the New Testament, though, that when they finished beating our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that his visage, that his appearance, it was so marred, you couldn't even recognize him. He was beaten beyond recognition. And then his form, it goes on to say, you notice that? His form more than the sons of men. Or his form was also marred more than the sons of men. Now say with me, this is going to tie in. It's going to really get you here in a minute in a great way. Jesus was not only completely beaten beyond record, where you couldn't even recognize him. He was beaten to the point his entire body was disfigured. Completely disfigured. How many times have you known people some close to you, family members, that you saw sickness mar their appearance. You saw sickness disfigure their body. The reason why Christ had to undergo that type of beating is because it doesn't matter how disfiguring and how marring sickness can come upon an individual, Jesus Christ can make them whole again. My God, everyone needs to give a round of applause to Christ for that. It doesn't matter how debilitating, how disfiguring sickness comes upon someone and wreaks havoc upon their physiological frame. And they become, you've seen that, haven't you? But people, you know, maybe they might even be family. You've seen sickness literally change their countenance that you almost, if you didn't know them, if you weren't close to them, you wouldn't recognize them. You wouldn't know who they were because they can't even be recognized. Jesus knew that Satan would continue to disfigure people through the course of time to disfigure them physically, to completely mar their bodies any way he possibly could. So Jesus said, I'm going to go to the depth and back. I'm going to allow myself to be beaten and disfigured beyond recognition 
that when sickness or disease comes upon a child of God, that when sickness or disease disfigures you and where people can't even recognize you, Jesus can take care of that and completely heal and erase the marring and disfigurement and make you whole again. For more information about our teaching resources, visit our website at CICLive.com.